it's inexcusable that more than 20 years down the line, there are post office victims who still uh, are waiting to get any proper compensation. Yeah. I mean, it's just inexcusable. And it's doing, it does, it does two things. It does damage to the government, but it also is an enormous reproach to the justice system, which failed uh, these individuals uh, in a calamitous and systemic way. Yeah, well, let's speak now to Paul Marshall, a barrister representing post office uh, sub-postmasters uh, in their fight for compensation. Hi, Paul. Hi, hi. Good, uh, uh, good, good to have you with us. I mean, presumably you've, it's, it's been a good week for you in as much as it's back in the headlines again and people who need to face difficult questions are facing difficult questions. Yes, I mean, it's absolutely brilliant. And the portrayal of the postmasters and the events as they happened, um, I was only able to catch up with it <laughs> around midnight last night. But I, I watched two and a half episodes. Um, it's absolutely outstanding. G give us a sense of where you are and the sort of cases that you're working with in terms of trying to get money for sub-postmasters, sub-postmistresses wrongfully accused of, uh, of false accounting. Well, I, I, I represent... Uh, applicants for compensation across all three schemes that's the what's now called the shortfall compensation scheme which i think had about three and a half thousand applicants and um, the group litigation scheme which is uh the uh, civil claimants in the bates litigation uh which is the government scheme uh, and has a potential of about 550 claimants and what's called the overturn conviction scheme uh, which is not really a scheme at all. It's it's claims for damages by people who were wrongfully prosecuted by the post office, about um, 600, possibly upward as many as uh, 900 of people in that category. Um, I th I, I, I'm not altogether familiar with the exact figures, but I think um, in the shortfall compensation scheme, that's those who weren't affected by the, either the litigation or weren't convicted. I think there have been some 2,000 or so um, claims and offers made. Um, the uh, overturn conviction scheme, a tiny number of cases have been properly and fully complicate, uh, compensated, and that's because they're complicated uh, cases. Um, my overall impression of the compensation schemes, the three operating, is uh, that they lack the requisite transparency uh, they lack the requisite independence for proper confidence to be had in them, and they are extremely difficult. Um, I happen to have amongst my clients some of the worst affected uh, victims of the post office. Um, and I'll just give you one example. Um, Tracy Felstead was 19 when she was prosecuted in uh, 2002 and convicted at the age of 19. Her conviction was quashed in 2021 uh, and uh, she is yet to receive uh, proper and substantial compensation. Um, and the central difficulty in all of this seems to me, or one central difficulty seems to me, that um, all those who were convicted it's pretty obvious that they suffered massive uh, damage and loss as a result of their experience. If you lost, if you were convicted and imprisoned in 2002, it doesn't require great insight to realise that that has blighted your life. Now, what value do you put on that? Uh, and it seems to me pretty, pretty straightforward, a large sum. Um, my general view on the compensation is that it ought to be pulled together under one supervising independent authority everybody who's been affected by the post office ought to be given flat compensation. Those who are convicted, everybody knows about the government scheme to offer £600,000 to those who were wrongfully convicted as a sort of take or leave it offer. It seems to me that if you were prosecuted by the post office wrongfully uh, and ex hypothesized maliciously, uh, every one of those people ought to receive a flat interim payment of £600,000. And if they want more, they should apply for it and it should be properly assessed. Now, the argument against that is, well, this is government money, this is taxpayers' money. Uh, it seems to me that arguments about, um, as it were, prudence and expenditure <laughs> are long uh, over now. And uh, all those who've been affected ought to be compensated. And the other thing is, 
um, the, the compensation schemes ought to be fully independent and fully transparent. And at the moment, they're not. And the consequence of that is it's taking an inordinate amount of time uh, for individuals who've been, in many cases, grievously affected uh, to get compensation. Yeah. You know, it's, it's just it's just it's inexcusable that more than 20 years down the line, there are post office victims who still uh, are waiting to get any proper compensation. Yeah. I mean, it's just inexcusable. And it's doing it does it does two things. It does damage to the government, but it also is an enormous reproach to the justice system, which failed uh, these individuals. Uh, in a calamitous and systemic way Absolutely. over and ruined pretty, lives. pretty well 20 years. And like you said, ruined lives. In the case of Tracy, you know, her entire adult life, half of her, her entire life has been taken up uh, by this. Um, Paul, we've had so many people who've got in touch about uh, the role of Fujitsu in this, the role of <laughs> post office bosses, and why the police haven't acted on anything. So so what's your your assessment on, are there grounds do you think for the police to, to be investigating the way that post office and fujitsu have behaved during this whole thing yeah well i mean the the, the bottom line is, is is the post office hijacked the criminal justice system and used it for its own purposes for about 14 years when it realized suddenly that the game was up and it had to stop prosecuting on the basis that it had been doing and it hijacked it by doing two things it one lied uh, that is to say, it said uh, in repeated uh, civil and criminal cases that it believed that the Horizon system was working properly when it wasn't, and it was known not to be. Um, and one of the things that's come out in the inquiry, very interestingly, is that um, right from the get-go, back in 1999, it was known when this system was foisted upon the post office by the government. Um, little anecdote in 1999 there was a select committee meeting at which the government rejected the horizon system its prototype uh, uh, as exposing the government to a fiasco to the risk of a fiasco now that fiasco has eventuated mm. in a slightly different way through the post office so it was known from the get-go that it was that it was a flawed system so the post office was driven effectively by the government to pretending that what it was given uh, was a reliable system but it lied to the court and the other thing that it did systemically was to withhold material evidence on a colossal scale from the courts. And the courts basically depend, all the administration of justice, criminal and civil, depends on the proper uh, and candid disclosure of documents. And that means documents that adversely affect a party's case, doesn't matter whether they're in civil law or criminal uh, prosecutions. Uh, and what the post office did was basically, it withheld the relevant uh, information uh, and uh, lied about the reliability of uh, of Horizon. Now, it seems to me that on the face of it, and I'm saying on the face of it, I'm not actually a criminal lawyer, but on the face of it, I do know a bit of law. Um, on the face of it, there was the most enormous conspiracy to pervert the course of justice. And uh, part of the reason I'm pretty confident that post office, uh, the police haven't done anything thus far, or, and, yeah. and certainly no charge has been brought, is that they're waiting to see what further comes out in the uh, inquiry. But the more that comes out, the more terribly damaging it is. One of the things that's emerged, for example, is that the post office, being one of the um, longest established prosecuting authorities in the country, in fact, indeed, the longest established, um, there was no there was no differentiation between uh, the investigation branch of the post office and the prosecuting branch of the post office. And when you put that together with the post office itself being the alleged victim. You have the uh, victim that's extraordinary. being the, yeah, yeah, was... the, 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 the victim, the investigator, and the prosecutor. And one of the, some of the things that really, uh, very interestingly, have come out uh, in the inquiry, very, very damagingly to the post office, yeah. is that um, it routinely prosecuted on the basis of uh, evidence that was simply insufficient to... Uh, maintain and, and advance. And that, the, that the, comes the, that comes across so so strongly in the uh, in the TV show as well. Paul, it's really good to speak to you. Thank you for for joining us, Paul Marshall, a barrister representing uh, victims of the post office uh, scandal.